Family trees are names on a page, but they're more than names on a page, aren't they? Because each name on the page has a story. Each name connects to the past, to the present, to the future. Their stories shape our stories. My great-great-great-grandparents were married where I live, St. Philip's. On Christmas Eve, 1857, St. Philip's is one year old. James Chambers married Margaret McBride. You can see there, Margaret signs with an X because we think that she was illiterate. James was a mariner who lived aboard the Uncle Tom, Margaret a domestic servant who lived in Bathurst Street. They're married and settled just across the road on 409 Kent Street. Together they had four children, but their life was a life of tragedy. Two of them died in young age. James tragically died, captaining a ship at age 39 off the coast of the South uh, near Nowra, and she tragically was known to have many convictions and offences. Following their hard life, we see that that trickled down the generations. Their story, in many ways, shapes my story. And today we're in Matthew 1, and it begins with a genealogy. It's a family tree of sorts, and each of their names from the past connects with the present and shapes the future. These stories shape Israel's story, but I want to show you today that it shapes our story as well. Well, let's orient ourselves to begin with. We've called this series God's Mega Story, and in many ways today we come to the climax, Jesus. But a quick recap. In week one we began in creation where we saw that God made the world. The world was then plummeted into what we call the fall in Adam and Eve's sin, but God wants his world back. In week two, we saw the roadmap for that through Abraham. God chose Abraham and gave him three promises of people, land, and the promise of blessing. And we see that those promises began their fulfillment. The nation grew, but in stop three at Moses, the story of the Exodus, we see that they are enslaved, but God liberates his people. He gives them his law and he makes a covenant with them. Well, the nation then was given the land promised to Abraham through the conquest of stop four, Joshua. And then in stop five, we, saw, we, we see that God instills a king in his land. They have rest from their enemies. They are secure and the Lord's presence and blessing amongst them into the city in the tabernacle. Then last week we saw the story of the exile, stop six. And the exile is a death of sorts. Israel, through their persistent sin, had come under God's judgment and were exiled from his place and his presence. But there was a glimmer of hope, a promise, that one day God would vanquish their enemies and bring them back home. That is the sweep of the Old Testament. And then at the end of the Old Testament, we see that a small number returned home, but they were a frail frail and a pale nation compared to their former glory. And then it was 400 years of silence. No word from God in that time. I don't know, this time of year in winter, gardens often lay dormant. They look dead. Our rose bush on the balcony looks dead. But it's not. Underneath, its roots are still growing. And it prepares to bud and then blossom in springtime. And this is like the period between the Old and the New Testament. Although there was 400 years of silence, God was working under the ground. And then, with the emergence of the stories of the gospel, we see the story continue and blossom to a new chapter. So the end of the Old Testament is not the end of the first story, moving on to the second. It's the same story, just the beginning of a new chapter. Well, today, if we look at this family tree, this genealogy, we can wave our mouse over it, and it'd be like a hyperlink. A hyperlink is where you you hover your mouse over it, and it links it to another page. And if we hover our our mouse over the various names in this genealogy, it'll bring up their stories. And there's three key moments in the story today. 
you'll see there it's summarized in verse 17. Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. These are all stops in God's mega story, but Matthew zones in on three of these. And as we hover over their names, we see the way that these past stories connect with the present ones in Jesus. We will see that Jesus is the next stop in this mega story, but in many ways he is the climax. But the Bible does this in a rich and textured way. See, Jesus coming comes both to fulfill God's promises to Abraham. There's a progressive movement to it, as you can see there in the slide. But the Bible also does it using patterns in the Old Testament. At each stop are images of people, offices, place or events. And all of these in their own ways point to Christ. And so as we look at these at this stop in the mega story today, we're going to be drawing upon both the promises and the patterns. See, the gospel writers weave these images in so that we can see Jesus in all his glory. And we'll see how the coming of Jesus fulfills the promises to Abraham and Israel. The coming of Jesus is the coming of the son of David, the eternal saviour king. And the coming of Jesus signals the end of exile and the return back to God. Well, firstly, the coming of Jesus fulfills the promises to Abraham and Israel. In the past, your, your surname often identified you, but it was a name which was given to you. And often it did more than that. It identified your vocation. Your vocation was bound up in your name, your surname. But now we, we speak of identity more as something we generate. We build an identity. But that aside, you know, what do you find your identity in? So it could be a combination of both of these things. It might be a past failure or the hope of a future success. Or it might be that you find your identity in your work or accomplishments or in your personality or something that you're good at. Well, as we hover our mouse over Abraham, we're taken to stops of one to four and we see Jesus fulfill the promise of a people. And this is about an identity. See, it centers on the promise of a people made in week two. And Jesus fulfills that promise. And, and Matthew begins, after his genealogy, by rendering Jesus' story almost as a continuation of Israel's story. Jesus, as it were, re-steps the footsteps of Israel. But he does so, and in doing so, corrects their missteps and brings blessing to the whole world. In Matthew 4, we, we see this. In Matthew 4, we see Jesus, the true image of God, is tested by Satan to doubt God. It takes us back to week 1, where we see Adam failed when he too was tempted. But here, Jesus, a new or second Adam, succeeds. Matthew then kind of brings up images of week three where we see Israel are a people but in slavery and God saved them through the exile, through the exodus, crossing the waters into the wilderness and there they're given their new, the law and there they're called to be a holy people reflecting his character and obeying his law. Yet what we see is they failed. But Matthew picks up on this and he echoes it in Chapters 2 to 4 of Matthew, we see Jesus escapes from Egypt. He crosses the waters in his baptism into the wilderness. He calls a new people to himself, the disciples. And then he climbs a mountain, ascends a mountain as it were, and gives them a new code for living. It's obvious for those who have eyes to see. This is Jesus, the new Israel, bringing about a new exodus. But where Israel failed, Jesus or the second Israel succeeds. But this doesn't line up with what people were expecting. See, those that represent the old Israel reject Jesus. They try to trap him and eventually they crucify him. But by walking the path of Israel faithfully, Jesus brings about a new exodus. And this time from a true enemy, as we saw in week three of sin and death. And his perfect obedience and perfect sacrifice render us a new 
Israel, a new people of God, which he formed around himself. Now, the new Israel will consist of not only those who physically descend from Abraham, but those who spiritually descend by faith in Jesus. The risen son of Abraham is multiplying a people among the nations. The significance of that for us is that those who have faith in Jesus are now part of God's people. The New Testament draws even richer language to describe this. It describes those in Christ as adopted in him, that is, as sons and daughters. If you think back to our identity, so much of our identity is us trying to generate it. But the beauty about being part of God's people, his sons and daughters, is it's not an identity that we generate ourselves, but it's one that's given to us through the work of Christ. It's unshakable. But to truly embrace and live in this identity, we must understand where it comes from. It comes from the risen son of Abraham. It comes from Christ. It's in Christ. We see how the mega story shapes our story. Well, secondly, we see the name David emerge in this genealogy. If we were to hover our mouse over David as a hyperlink, we'd be taken back to week five. And there we see David instilled as a king. Naomi and I have been recently watching a series on Netflix called How to Become a Tyrant. It's a bit tongue-in-cheek, but it's framed as a playbook for aspiring dictators. I'm not looking for a career change just yet. But it cycles through the history's recent despots and it shows all the common steps that they make. Fascinating watch. If we hover our mouse over David, we, we see a ruler emerge in, in Israel. But we are taken also to see Jesus as the promised new eternal Saviour King. Well, what promises does Jesus fulfil? Well, it centres on the promise of this future King. And Matthew begins by rendering Jesus' story as a continuation of David's. It's as if Jesus is retracing the vocation of the King. In many ways, David's reign marks the high point of Israel's history. It seems initially as if God had fulfilled his promise to Abraham. God's people were in the land he had promised them. They were numerous. And David, God's king, had brought peace and prosperity. And he'd even brought the tabernacle, God's presence, into the city of God, Jerusalem. Yet David, like Israel and Adam before him, spectacularly fails. In How to Become a Tyrant, it was interesting to see that some despots started off okay, but their power and influence corrupted. They became compromised. They morphed into, rather than always had been, a tyrant. And now that David was king, he definitely wasn't a tyrant, but we see in week five that he definitely was compromised. In week five, we saw that Israel's high point is not in David, but rather in the future with the promise of a future king, a greater king who will bring a better rule and lead them into greater rest. And the coming of Jesus is the coming of the son of David, the eternal saviour king. Echoing Matthew 5, Jesus retraces the vocation of the king. Like David, he too was a boy born in Bethlehem. Like David, he was described as a king who would shepherd his people tenderly. Like David, he pleased his father, but not in a compromised fashion. He did it in all that he said and did. And like David, he delivered God's people from their enemies and brought rest, but not human enemies or armies, but rather the greatest enemy, sin and death bringing rest. Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is, second David, bringing a better kingdom. 
But this doesn't line up with what Israel was expecting. You see, Jesus' coronation will be on a cross, not a throne. He will build his kingdom through a message, not the sword. His kingdom will start small and in unexpected places, not among the elite and with royal pomp. The risen son of David was raised, vindicated as ruler, and now exercises his complete dominion. But unlike a tyrant, he uses it for good. His kingdom upturns the ways the world thinks about things. He comes to serve and not to be served. And these are the kingdom values that he calls us to live by. It's as if he's, he's handed us a script in how to live in light of the coming king. The mega story shapes our story. Well, thirdly and finally, the coming of Jesus signals the end of the exile and our return home to God. If we hovered our mouths over the exile, you'd see we'd be taken to week six, the exile. It's about our longing for home. Exile means banished or exiled from a place. It's like a death of sorts. Well, this week I listened to a podcast called Millennial Malays with Bridie Jaber. She is Guardian's opinion editor and the author of a recent book called Trivial Grievances. It's a book about what happens when life doesn't turn out the way that you thought it would. It's geared particularly at millennials. Millennials, she says, are born between 1980 and 1996. As a child of 1981, I slip in, although at other times when it's less advantageous, I take the Gen X line. But she speaks about being 30 and what she describes as the kind of meh feeling about it. And one interesting point she picks up is that a common feeling is a sense of disconnectedness or, or rootlessness amongst millennials. And part of this is the lack of home ownership. Millennial complaints about being priced out of the housing markets aren't about entitlement, she says, but rather more a desire for a sense of home or to put down roots. You see, we all have a longing for home. And exile is that feeling of rootlessness. Well, what did Jesus promise of the coming Messiah fulfill for those in exile? Well, it centers on the promise of a home. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise of his presence. And Matthew begins by rendering Jesus' story again as the continuation of the exile story. Jesus brings about the restoration of home. And if we hover our, our, our mouse over exile, the hyperlink would take us back to last week. Stop six. There, Israel in foreign lands, hostile to God, exiled from his presence. The promises to Israel are seemingly unraveled. But there is hope. There is a promise of restoration. A Messiah who would bring them back. And then when Matthew, in chapter 1, in the genealogy, speaks of the coming Messiah, he does so in a way which is striking. See, he doesn't mention the return of some of the exiles as the Old Testament does, but rather he just runs straight through to the Messiah. It moves from exile to Messiah. It's almost as if the end of the exile hasn't happened, but rather the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, is the end of the exile. It's a signpost. He is the way home to God. But this again doesn't line up with what Israel was expecting. They had expected that this Messiah would vanquish the enemies, ending exile. A king would kick out the foreign rule and restore Israel. But Jesus, we are told, has come back to restore them from a greater exile. An exile that began way back in week one when humanity was banished from the garden. Joseph, we see in chapter 2, is told in a dream to name his son Jesus. Think, week 4, like Joshua, which means Yahweh saves, and he will save his people from their sin. See, Israel's sin led them into exile, 
and Jesus will come and lead them home. Not to Jerusalem, but back to himself. The risen Jesus has come to draw people home by way of the cross. Jesus was exiled for us. That is, he sat under God's judgment for us in order to bring us home. And he promises that he will come and take us home fully and finally in the end. We may or may not be able to purchase a home. That's that either case, that's uncertain, isn't it? We can't put our trust in that. But Jesus left his home and made his dwelling amongst us. And he did so to bring us home and assurance of our future with him. And he gives us his spirit, which is like the ultimate seal of ownership. And in the meantime, he dwells us by this same spirit to comprehend his love for us and give up power to live for him. The mega story shapes our story. Well, to close, we've seen that Jesus is the son of Abraham, fulfilling the promise of a people, bringing blessing to the nations. But that also enables us to be part of his family. In Christ, we have found our true identity. We've seen that Jesus is the son of David. He fulfills the promise of a king who would bring a rule of peace. He is the shepherd who, who leads those gently to rest. A king whose rule brings flourishing and life. In Christ, we find ultimate rest. We have seen that Jesus is the Messiah who brings the exiles home, fulfilling the promises of a place and God's presence among us. In Christ, we find our true home. But these promises are in Christ. Or another way to put that is they're connected to his story. See, if you're not connected to Jesus' story, if you're not in Christ then you remain excluded from God's people. You remain under the rule and judgment of the cruel master sin. You're exiled and unable to find your way home. But Jesus offers us an invitation to come to him, to entrust ourselves to him. And we do that through repentance and faith. Through repentance by giving up the striving to be the centre of our own stories. And by faith, by finding our identity, our rest and our home in him.